I like Calvin and Fred Hammond, and so that's gonna come out of me a lot on today, okay? Okay? Okay. So, so I know you like rap, and usually on rap, when someone's on stage, there's a call and response. So when I say, okay, or amen somebody, or give God a praise right there, I actually want you to do something, all right? All right? It's just gonna take a little practice, it's okay. Now, shout out to Propaganda. Um, his album is on pre-sale today, if you did not know that. And so, I gotta shout out the home team. I'm excited, I'm excited because I just like God. <laughs> I, I like talking about God and I think um, in ministry, <clears throat> there is a lot of war. And I think at the base level of our warfare, I don't think Satan is really after the ministry first. I think he's after the minister. And so the message tonight will really be to dig into your own heart, your own soul to equip you to fight the schemes of the devil. Um, if you have a Bible, we'll be in there tonight. I know a lot of preachers nowadays don't use that. Um, but we will. Um, if you got a tangible Bible, that's great. I know uh, we used to say turn to something, but now we say click to something. But anyway, you don't have to turn anywhere yet. Way before any of us existed, there was a garden named Eden that held the first human beings. Their names were Adam and Eve. God had primarily made them for his glory. And he constructed this world in their home to function for their good. He'd given them free reign over everything with one exception. They could not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Some time had passed and the snake walked up to Eve and began to converse with her about God. He asked one question and this question on the surface seemed reasonable, thoughtful even. He asked her about the word of God. He said, did God really say you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? Eve responds, not with a rebuke, but an answer. Perhaps she had not known who she was talking to yet, enough to be able to discern what this snake was really after. She might have thought that he was just there to help her verbally process the word of God, but oh no, Eve, sweetie, this snake is Satan and he is here to destroy you. Therefore, the questions that are being posed are questions designed to make you see God a little bit differently, a little bit darker, not in the same light as he did or you did before. He then convinces her that the judgment God promised would come if she disobeyed his command was not the truth at all, that God was saying something that he didn't mean and she believed him, the devil that is. So she looked at the tree and noticed some good things about it that made it worse, disobedience, and she ate from it. It ain't like God was going to judge her anyway, she thought. Then she gave some to Adam, who was right there, and he ate, and their eyes were opened, and then death and sin entered into everybody that would come after them. As we seek to address this concept of spiritual warfare, we must understand that it's real and that it's happening constantly. The way spiritual warfare is talked about sometimes can be a bit weird, you know, people who think everything is a demon and a spirit, which is not always the case. But on the other end, there are also Christians who act like it's not a reality at all. And I don't know which side of the pendulum concerns me most. There are three persons to be considered in understanding spiritual warfare. There is God, there is Satan, and there is you. Hear me, there is not a war between Satan and God anymore. God defeated Satan a long time ago. This warfare doesn't have a lot to do with that, but it does have a lot to do with God, however. I want you to know that Satan is not after your house. He's not after your ministry. He's not after your marriage. He's not after your children. All of these are messed with as a means to an end, but not the means itself. Satan is ultimately after your faith in God. Where do I get that from, you say? Let's turn to, or click, uh, to Ephesians 6. You just got to use your thumb or your index, whichever you prefer. Verses 10 through 16. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. 
put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand firm. Stand therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. Here we see that your faith is what extinguishes, what suppresses, what makes something to quench the darts of Satan. And imagine, so imagine being in a war and you got your belt on, praise God. Uh, You got your breastplate, you need that. Um, You got your shoes, you put on your helmet, amen. Um, Then you grab your sword because the devil is a lie. Um, And then you walk out to the field and you see darts with flames on the end flying your way. How will you protect your body from the darts you can and cannot see if you have no shield to hide behind? The thing is the belt of truth the breastplate of righteousness, the shoes of gospel peace, the helmet of salvation will do you no good if you don't have the faith that produces what these pieces of armor represent. So if there is anything that Satan wants you to let go of, it's your shield. Because once your shield is gone, you are dead. Romans 14, 23 tells us, for whatever does not proceed from faith is sin. And Romans 6.23 says, for the wages of sin is death. And that's exactly what happened to Adam and Eve. They believed the wrong person and it killed them spiritually. It separated them from God because they were no longer holy as he is holy. After God confronted Adam, then Eve, then Satan, he dispenses curses to each one of them. But inside of the curse that God gave to Satan, we find something very interesting. God says in Genesis 3.15, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Very weird language. What is the Lord talking about here? He is letting Satan know that someone is coming. That though this woman you deceived or through this woman you deceived, deceived will come a man that you will try to do the same to and he will triumph over you. I love how in Satan's judgment God gives us a promise. Who is this man God is talking about? Is it Moses? Is it Abraham, maybe Isaac, maybe Jacob? Could it be David or Jacob? No, sorry to disappoint you, but none of them were qualified for such a task. He is talking about Jesus Christ, the son of the living God. In Luke chapter four, which is where we will be camping out for the rest of our time, we have just left the scene of Jesus' baptism. The Holy Spirit has descended on him in bodily form And the father has confirmed him audibly by saying, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Then we come to chapter four, verse one, if you could read along with me. And Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the spirit in the wilderness for 40 days, being tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those days. And when they were ended, He was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. And the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, I will give all this authority and their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. And Jesus answered him, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. And he took him to Jerusalem and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you. And on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. And when the devil had ended every temptation, 
he departed from him until an opportune time. I love the Bible. I, I'm about to get excited. Are you excited? I hope you are. I just like it. Um, Jesus has just left his baptism, and he goes straight into the wilderness. This is not a random decision. decision. Jesus isn't lost. He is following the Spirit's lead. Scripture says that he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. The Spirit has filled him. The Father has confirmed him. And now it is time for this Son of God, this long-awaited Christ, to be tested. And what better way to test the Christ than by placing him in the wilderness. If you know anything about Old Testament, then you know that God has led his own into the wilderness before. After setting the people of Israel free from the bondage that they were under in Egypt, God guided his people into the wilderness. But sadly, due to their unbelief, God judged them, causing them to wander in the wilderness for 40 years. Here, we have Jesus being led into the wilderness for 40 days. For 40 days, Jesus ate Nothing. Shout out to you if you've ever done a 40-day fast. I don't have that type of godliness just yet, but uh, <laughs> praise God for you. I'll do whole 30, though. Um, <laughs> after 40 whole days of no food, his muscles were probably weak, his energy low, his body was probably considerably thinner due to the loss of fat and muscle, and not surprisingly, at the end of 40 days, first two says that he was hungry. I love how human we see Jesus being here. It is then that the devil continues his temptation. Notice I did not say starts his temptation. Verse 2 tells us that Jesus was in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by the devil. This testing, this temptation, this warfare, if you will, had already been going on. So not only is Jesus weak physically, but he has been enduring spiritually. Eve couldn't endure past one question, but this man... This son of God is altogether different. Verse 3, the devil said to him, if you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. If, I mean, God just told him that he was. I don't, I, maybe you were a little bit confused. The thing is, he is not questioning the deity and the sonship of Jesus. This if is to be understood as since. Since you are the son of God, command this stone to become bread. Satan is aware of what it means for Jesus to be the son of God. He gets the implications of this title. He gets that it would mean that he was the one in the beginning who created the heavens and the earth. That he is the one who made man out of dust. That he is the one who caused manna from heaven to fall and feed the people of Israel while in the wilderness. He is aware that his sonship makes him equal with God. Therefore, he is more than able to provide for others by way of something supernatural. So why not do it for yourself, Jesus? Just do you, God. You're hungry. We're in the wilderness. Pick any stones. There's a whole bunch of them. And tell it, command it to become bread. You have a habit of using your words to do miracles, so do it right now. As I mentioned earlier, there is a motive behind Satan's suggestions. There is something about God that he does not want Jesus to believe. In this first temptation, Satan wants Jesus to distrust the satisfaction of God. On the surface, his suggestion seems reasonable, thoughtful even. You're hungry, so feed yourself. But Satan doesn't really care if Jesus is hungry or full. What he cares about is if he can keep Jesus from trusting God to provide his sustenance. Jesus was a man. He had to eat. That is natural. But he was being tempted to decide when and how the food would come. Jesus has come to do the will of his father, period. He did not move beyond what God sent him and led him to do. So this test here is the temptation to not depend on God for what is necessary for survival, but instead to give in to the desires of the body and satisfy self. And we are always tempted to do the same. If you've ever found yourself, oops, in an evangelistic or discipleship discussion with someone who is same-sex attracted, you will find that a common hindrance to faith in Christ is the potential that submission to Christ could possibly mean being celibate for life. 
Not because of the choice, but because of the absence of sexual attraction for the opposite sex. By God's grace, many have not seen this as a hindrance, but as a beautiful cross to bear, but for others. The idea that they may have to spend their entire life with only Jesus and his church is an idea to be rejected at all costs. Jesus has made us for community, for relationship. He is by nature a God of community, one God and three distinct persons. So to want a relationship is how he made you. It's natural, just like being hungry is natural, but Satan will consistently leverage what is natural to bait you into what is sinful. The same sex attracted person who has rejected Jesus because they cannot fathom the thought of being alone has made bread out of stone. When God has provided another means for their human needs to be met, mainly himself and his bride. The same goes for the man who continues to justify his lust by appealing to how God has made him as a man. Just because it's natural doesn't mean you need it to live. And Jesus, Jesus believes this. Verse 4, and Jesus answered him, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. You see how quick Jesus is? He is not here to have a whole discussion with the devil. <laughs> Jesus immediately says, it is written. Jesus quickly references scripture because he trusts it. It is written in his heart. He easily discerns the lie of Satan and knows how to respond because he was prepared. Many Christians give in quickly to temptation mainly because they don't spend enough time on the Word of God. They can easily recollect everything else on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram except the Word of truth. But Jesus depends on the Word because he depends on God and it has prepared him for this fight. Jesus says, man shall not live by bread alone. What is he quoting? The New Testament hasn't been written, so he's obviously quoting from the Old Testament. He is referencing Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 3. All of his rebukes, by the way, are from Deuteronomy when the people of God were in the wilderness. See the coincidence. Moses is in the wilderness during the 40 years, and he's warning and encouraging and reminding Israel of God's word. And chapter 8 in particular, he brings up how in the wilderness, God humbled them by letting them hunger. Then he fed them with manna. Manna was a bread-like wafer that would fall from heaven so that they would know one thing. And then what is that? That man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. I'm not sure why Jesus didn't quote the entire verse, but his point gets across very clear. Satan wants Jesus to believe that he needs bread to live. Jesus affirms the truth that bread is not what would keep him alive, but it's the God who would provide the bread that does. We give a lot of credit to our food for feeding us or our job for providing for us, or our homes, or relationships for comforting us, or our gifts for making room for us, which in a sense they do, but if God did not want you to eat, you would not. If God did not want you to receive comfort, you wouldn't. If God did not want you to have a platform to use your gifts, you would not. The reality of what these things provide is not owed to the things themselves, but the God who gave them to us. This is why we lose our minds when any of these things are threatened. Because we started really believing that we needed them to live and move and have our being and not God himself. <laughs> Jesus refuses to give in to such a lie. He is confident that his God will supply all of his needs and that he will sustain him and that when it is time for him to die, he knows that it won't be because he starved to death but because he laid it down. Verse five, and the devil took him up and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time and said to him, to you, <laughs> that was just weird, to you, God, I will give all this authority in their glory for it has been delivered to me and I will give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. With the second temptation, Satan shows Jesus all the kingdoms of the world and what Luke describes as a moment in time. We know from Matthew that this temptation is taking place on a mountain. 
It seems as if Jesus was being shown a visual, a vision or supernatural like images of the kingdoms of the world in quick succession like this before his eyes, which is highly feasible seeing that Satan is a supernatural being. He is able to move in and out of dimensions that we have no idea about. Seeing that he had access to the throne of God to accuse Job at one point, and now he is on a physical, tangible mountain with Jesus. Satan, in some ways, displays all of these kingdoms before Jesus and says that they have been given to him, and that he will be a nice little demon by giving it to Jesus. The question to be asked is, is Satan telling the truth? Has he been given authority over all the kingdoms of the world? Scripture does say that Satan is the prince or the ruler of this world, the god of this age and the prince of the power of the air. I mean, having the, hearing the titles prince and god being ascribed to Satan could seem to affirm what he's telling Jesus about himself. But what we must understand is that what he is prince over and god over is all that is dark, wicked, untrue, ungodly, unholy, unrighteous. He is no God or prince over the kingdoms of the world, but he is the God of the people that occupy these kingdoms. He is the God of every human being that is a slave to sin. A commentator said it this way, the name God is given to Satan not because he has any divine attributes, but because he actually has the homage of the people of this world as their God as the being who was really worshiped and has their affections. So was Satan telling the truth? Partially. Remember, Satan is a liar and a very good one. He will tell you a lie with a little bit of truth, but he does, so he does ha indeed have a measure of power, but this power has nothing to do with having authority over entire kingdoms, so he is lying to Jesus because a half-truth is no truth at all. The interesting thing about what Satan is offering uh, Jesus is that the language he uses is similar to a prophecy regarding the Son of Man in Daniel 7. I'm gonna read it to you, and I want you to pay attention to any words that sound familiar to Satan's temptation. I'll give you some inflections so you can notice them. And behold, with the clouds of heaven there came one like a Son of Man, and he came to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So they, Daniel is prophesying that one day the Son of Man will be given dominion and glory and a kingdom. And here Satan is saying, hey, though, I got it. I got all the authority and the glory in my back pocket. I just showed you. You can have it on one condition. Worship me. If Jesus gives in to what Satan is saying, there will be something about God he has chosen not to believe or chosen not to believe. What is that? Satan is tempting Jesus to distrust the worthiness of God. How do I know this? Look at Jesus' response in verse 8. And Jesus answered him, It is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. You know what a major difference between you and Jesus is? Jesus was not born in sin. Jesus did not come into, the world, into this world under the dominion of its God. Because he has always known and loved the true God perfectly. He was and is God in the flesh, so he is able to experience temptation but will never give in to it. So perhaps Satan thought he could do to Jesus what he's been doing to us since the beginning of time, which is to trick us into believing that he get, could give us something that he doesn't have. He's done it when he's deceived you into believing that the sinful relationship would give you joy. Or when you thought that unforgiveness could pacify your pain. Or maybe you could relate to the lie that you will get away with serving two masters. That as long as you're a good person, that you don't really have to repent because God is a God of love and grace, not wrath or judgment. If this describes you, what you have believed as rational ways to live your life are lies you have believed from Satan himself. He has offered you something that he does not own so that you will lose what you have always needed. Which is God. Only God can heal your pain 
The sin of unforgiveness will never be able to do that. God is the source, as 1 Corinthians says, of all comfort, not a human being. Hypocrisy is not the path to life but death. It is only the surrendered person that will know what it truly means to be free. When we live as slaves to sin, we live under the dominion of Satan himself. You don't have to wear 666 to be a worshiper of the devil. Just keep going through life, rejecting the command of God to repent and believe and you did it already. In Matthew 28, after Jesus resurrected, he tells his disciples that all authority in heaven and in earth has been given to him. Before his ministry begins, Satan says that he will give Jesus authority over kingdoms. After his bodily ministry is completed, Jesus says that he has it. We know that Jesus did not give in to the temptation, so what did he have to do to get this authority after all? In between the temptation and the exaltation was suffering. Isaiah 53, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Satan would have preferred if Jesus got his authority through disobedience. He would have preferred if Jesus took the easy way out, but God was too valuable for Jesus to skip the cross before he got his crown. Philippians 2.8 says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed upon him the name that is above every name. So at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. The authority and the glory and the dominion that Jesus was going to get only came through obedience to the Father. Jesus had come to do the will of his father, and that meant he was here to serve him, to worship him like he has been doing in all of eternity. Why? Because no one else is worthy. Who is like him? Who is more deserving of glory than him? Who else can say that all things were created through him and for him? Nobody but the Lord of hope the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. Don't let Satan deceive you into believing that a created thing is worthy of one more glory than the one that created it. Sin will never ever give you what it promises. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Verse nine, and he took him to Jerusalem set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if since you are the son of God, throw yourself down from here for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you and on their hands they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. Satan is relentless. First he wanted Jesus to turn stones into bread then he wanted Jesus to worship him. Now he wants Jesus to jump off the top of the temple. He's just getting more and more obnoxious. I guess that's to be expected of demons. Um, they have now moved from the wilderness to the temple in Jerusalem. This is the temple that people of Israel really thought a lot of. It was built first by Solomon, then destroyed, then it was built over again. Animal sacrifices were done. Atonement for sin was done. Simply put, this temple was the, temple was the center of religious life, and this is where Satan wants Jesus to jump from. This time, Satan backs up his temptation with Scripture. He quotes from Psalms 91. It's a psalm of trust. He might have gotten tired, you know, of Jesus firing back at him with Scripture, so he needs to remind Jesus that he knows Scripture too and that he will use it when it best suits his purposes. He says to Jesus, since you're the Son of God, you, since you seem to trust God so much, you keep using the Bible to dictate how you respond to me, so I have some encouragement for you. Jump off the temple. Show the people who you really are because God has said in his word 
the word that you really believe, that he will command his angels concerning you. They won't let you die, Jesus. That's if you trust God enough to prove that his word is true. So jump. If there has ever been a time that I feel that this temptation is relevant, it's now. Satan is still using and twisting scriptures in such a way that it deceives people. And the blame isn't on Satan, totally. It's on us, because Romans 1 says that we suppress the truth by our own unrighteousness, and that we are the ones who will accumulate teachers to suit our own passion. We, as humans, are prone to deception because we like what it offers. But we don't choose deception for deception's sake. We don't even give it those kinds of names. We call it prosperity gospel. We, we say things like, you know, God turned water into wine, so drunkenness isn't really a problem. I'm free in Christ. Or Ephesians 5 says that women must submit to their husbands, so that means that abuse is permissible. Or here's my favorite. The Bible says that God is love, so surely every single person should be able to love whomever they want to love, right? There are millions of people in bondage to sin not because they don't read the Bible, but because they made its contents mean something that it doesn't. Satan. Satan is using a psalm of trust to tempt Jesus into unbelief. What exactly does he want Jesus to stop believing about God then? I believe that he doesn't want Jesus to believe that God is faithful. This is how I came to that conclusion. By listening closely to Jesus' response, I believe the scriptures he uses to rebuke Satan exposes the lie that Satan is trying to conceal. Verse 12, and Jesus answered him, it is said, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. I used to think that Jesus was responding like my mama did when she would be like, you need to watch your mouth and watch who you're talking to, you know? Um, it's kind of like that, but not quite. This response comes from Deuteronomy 6, when Moses is telling the people of Israel not to put God to the test like they did in Exodus 17. What had happened was, is that the people of Israel had been delivered out of slavery to the Egyptians, right? They came to a point in the wilderness where they were thirsty. And so they start to talk crazy to Moses and thus God. And they said, why did you bring us up out of Egypt to kill us with thirst? So Moses prayed, and God answered them by giving them water out of a rock. The end of the narrative says this. Please listen to what Moses says. And he called the name of the place Massa and Meribah because of the quarreling of the people of Israel and because they tested the Lord by saying, is the Lord among us or not? God had delivered them out of slavery and promised to deliver them into a land flowing with milk and honey. And they are accusing God of delivering them for the sole purpose of killing them. And Moses says that that is the same thing as saying God is not with us. In other words, testing God is to doubt him with the heart of accusation that says, will he really do what he says that he will do? Will he really keep his promise? Will he really be good to us? Will he really deliver us? Will he really protect us? Will he really provide for us? Will he really sustain us or not? When Satan told Jesus to jump off the temple, he wanted Jesus to believe that that was the way he would be glorified and seen as the true son of God by his people. But if Jesus obeyed, he would have killed himself. The thing about Satan is Satan didn't care if Jesus died. He cared if Jesus died according to the will of God. If Jesus died the way God meant for it to happen, every power the devil thought he had would be utterly disarmed. God had already determined that the Son of God would be exalted, but it would come through a beaten body on a Roman cross. Even though the ministry before him was not going to be easy, he trusted God's will. Jesus can't put his Lord to the test because he knows his Lord is not a man that he should lie nor the son of man, that he should repent. What he said, he will do. Jesus knows that his God is faithful. So because he can and will command his angels concerning him, he will go to their cross. 
Because they can bear him up lest he strikes his foot against the stone, he will trust his faithfulness, the faithfulness of his God. The scripture Satan thought he could use to destroy the Son of God contained the promises that sustained the Son of God. I love the Bible. Listen, church. Satan is after your faith in God. Every single day there will be circumstances and trials that will arise in your life that you will be tempted to test God in. And I beg you, trust his faithfulness. Those trials are refining you. They are working together for your good so that you may grow in the image and the knowledge of your creator. Satan wants you to believe that the Christian life is easy. He wants you to put down your cross and take up your flesh instead of the other way around. But when you trust in the faithfulness of God, when you trust and believe that he is your protector and your provider and your comforter and your healer and your peace and your refuge, it doesn't mean that it will be easy, but it means you'll have joy. The beginning of the psalm that Satan quoted tells us this. I think he left this out on purpose. He says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High, will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. I'm so glad that Jesus trusted God because we can too. Verse 13, and when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. Do you know why this matters? You've probably heard this story so much that it doesn't amaze you anymore. But this is huge. With the first Adam, Satan was able to tempt and succeed. Through Adam's offspring, he was able to work their sin nature for his purposes. Through adultery and lust and murder and rape and pride, though God had consistently revealed himself as worthy of their affections, his people always found themselves kneeling at the feet of idols to get something only God had in himself. God had commanded, and every single person alive at one point or another had failed to obey, but here, for the first time in history, there is a man on earth that obeyed everything. Satan wanted Jesus to prove his sonship through sin, but Jesus proves it through his sinlessness. And because of this, he was able to be the sacrifice that we all, we who have broken God's law needed. He was qualified to take our sin and their judgment on himself because he was indeed spotless and without blemish and the perfect lamb of God, the lamb that was slaughtered for all the times that we've taken Satan at his word, all the times that we refuse to endure temptation, all the times that we have tested and doubted God, all the times that we have worship idols and when his work was done he said it is finished he laid his life down and he rose three days later crushing the serpent's head once and for all like God said he would do back in Genesis Satan has no power If you turn from your sins, yes, people at a Christian conference, if you turn from your sins and put your trust in Jesus, you will receive the power of the Holy Spirit and he will help you resist just like he did. If you have, if you have the Holy Spirit already, I beg you, don't be discouraged. Resistance is hard. It gets exhausting but remember you have a great high priest who has been there and done that he is working in and through his church to strengthen and sanctify you so don't isolate yourself because you're struggling too much he sympathizes with with you and he is interceding for you and he has a throne of grace that he beckons you to come and receive help when you need it This is crucial to understand because how you respond to temptation 
will impact your ministry. I know you're here to learn and be equipped, but Satan wants your faith. And if he sees that your faith is weak, he can weaken the faith of all of your disciples as you walk. At the end of the day, you have two choices. Believe God's word is true, or just simply take Satan at his. Let's pray. God, I